Hey guys, for those of you that have watched or listened to the podcast previously, you would know that I do the majority of these episodes by myself, just sharing my thoughts and opinion on everything Warriors basketball. Just going to change it up a little bit in this episode. I'm actually going to share your guys' takeaways from Saturday's preseason win over the Clippers that you provided in the YouTube comments on the latest episode. Uh, plenty of chatter on Moses Moody, Jonathan Kaminga, Lindy Waters. Really love the discussion on there, so I'm going to respond to it. And in doing so, also have a look at Wednesday's preseason game against the Kings. So stay tuned, particularly for those of you that commented on last episode. Welcome back to the Golden State with Mates podcast. Hope you're all having a good start to your week. As I referred to there in the intro, plenty of great discussion emanating from the last episode in the YouTube comments following the Warriors' thrilling 91-90 victory over the LA Clippers on Saturday in their first preseason game. Of course, the Lindy Waters buzzer-beating game-winning three that we will probably remember for quite a while, regardless of what Lindy Waters the third actually does for the remainder of his career. But I'm going to get into your guys' takeaways now. Plenty of different topics to discuss and respond to. We're going to start with Moses Moody. I feel like there's a collective groan among Warrior fans when it comes to to Moses Moody at the moment because we see a performance like we did on Saturday, 12 points, four rebounds, game high plus 14 in just 13 minutes of action, the 11th man used by Steve Kerr in that game. And I think we all see that and think, here we go again, another great Moses performance and then come opening night against the Portland Trail Blazers, he's going to get a DMP or he's going to play 11, 12 minutes and hardly hardly be utilized by Kerr. And I think uh, Kerr had an interview earlier uh, today as well. And just looking at the Twitter comments from that, there's a there's that collective groan as well, again, because Steve basically said that, you know, Moses is playing great. Uh, he's having a great training camp, but this is a numbers issue. Like in the fact that he had to kind of clarify that and, and pretty much put a butt in there, it's it's becoming a real issue and it's clear from what I see on social media and from, from what I see from you guys in the YouTube comments that this is a major frustration for Warrior fans as it has been for a couple of years now, really. I mean, this is a guy, remember back in his rookie season, he had like some solid performances in the playoffs against the Mavericks in the Western Conference Finals and now he's entering his fourth year and we're still not entirely sure what his role is going to entail. Uh, Evan Zamir, I apolog- first of all, I apologize if I mispronounce any of these YouTube names. Uh, Evan Zamir said, let's simplify this. Moody, Milton, and Wiggins are the only guys on the team who are legitimate two-way players. It's astonishing that Kerr still doesn't get that Moody needs to play. I wholeheartedly agree with that. And it really, you know, a light went off in my brain when I read this comment because I've been saying the entire offseason, even on last episode, that the way this Warriors roster is constructed that they really need to kind of pick and choose between offense and defense. And it's hard to actually put lineups out there that can be elite on both ends of the floor. But if you want to do that, then you need to put lineups out there with two-way players. And as Evan says here, it's really Moody, Milton, and Wiggins that are true two-way players that are not necessarily liabilities on both ends. Now, maybe Steve may argue against that with Moses with some of his stuff defensively, decision-making, that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, he is your kind of prototypical 3 and D wing. And he's also got other elements to his game that make him more than that, like Milton does as well, like Wiggins does as well. They're not all just 3 and D wings. They've got a little bit more juice offensively. Moses, you know, in terms of hustle plays, rebounding and stuff like that's really good. His uh, his third bucket, I think, or third or fourth but fourth bucket. He had the he had the dunk from the Kaminga pass, two threes, and then his fourth bucket, I think, uh, was a kind of dribbled baseline step back, nearly broke the ankles of the defender and hit the hit the uh, the baseline midi. So he's got some stuff off the bounce as well. But as Evan says, if you've got two way players on the roster. And otherwise, this roster has to specifically look at, you know, trying to prioritize offense or defense. You need to utilize the two-way players that you have on the roster. Because otherwise, as I've said entire throughout the offseason, there's too many players here that are either specialist offensive players or specialist defensive players. And Moses fits a mold where you can be elite on both ends of the floor with him out there. 
And we heard earlier today, Andrew Wiggins will miss Wednesday's game against the Kings, which is very, very disappointing. But that should only open up more opportunity for Moses to play and play more and potentially even start. Now, I know Steve, you know, after Saturday's win said that he's going to keep trying the the Steph, D'Anthony, Melton, Kaminga, Draymond, Trace starting five. Now, whether that's in actually a starting role or not, like he didn't clarify, he just said he wants to see more of it, basically. Against the Kings on Wednesday, not to, I mean, we're going to be talking more about Saturday's game, but to jump forward ahead to, to Wednesday's game a little bit, I wouldn't mind seeing a different starting five. It's a lineup that we saw for three minutes in the second quarter on Saturday, and that is Steph Melton, Moses, Kaminga, Draymond. So Moses in for TJD, basically, and him taking that Wigan spot at small forward. So those guys played three minutes. Uh, on on Saturday at like between the nine forty five and six forty five mark of the second quarter, they outscored the Clippers nine four in that span. Now I'm not saying that this lineup is going to be absolutely elite by any means. It is a small sample size, one preseason game of three minutes, small sample size. But I do think that's the kind of lineup that can be elite on both ends of the floor. And I think that Moses needs to be in these combinations a little bit more. And I would actually like to see that as the starting lineup, because you need, as the Warriors, you need to try and unearth something here in the preseason. And I actually think the preseason for Golden State is probably more important than most other teams, simply because of the uncertainty around the Warriors right now. And Steve has to unlock something, unearth something. He needs players to break away and really demand to him that they need to play genuine, you know, 25, 30 minute roles. And so I would put the onus on guys like Moses and JK on on Wednesday against the Kings. And I would say, all right, let's start that lineup. Draymond, you can guard Sabonis. If Draymond has no interest in guarding Sabonis in a preseason game, I don't really care. That's fine. But you know what I'd do? I'd say, Moses Moody, you want an opportunity? Okay, go out there and guard DeMar DeRozan. See how you go. Have Melton guard De'Aaron Fox. Melton, you're still bat- battling for a starting spot with pods and healed. Go out and show that you can be the elite perimeter defender by guarding one of the best guards in the league, in, in Fox. I'd also say to JK, okay, you've got a one-on-one matchup with Keegan Murray, both at both the power forward position. Very different players. I know Keegan Murray's a three-point shooter. We know JK is unstoppable at the rim. The three-point shooting is questionable. But both kind of in similar stages, similar stature around the league in terms of these young guys that are very talented. We're just waiting to see if they can take the next step. I think Warrior fans would say, yeah, we'd rather Kaminga, more talented, higher upside, that kind of thing. I think Kings fans would think they're pretty happy with Keegan Murray as well. So if I was Steve, I'd go to to JK and say, okay, we want you to play team basketball, but we also want you to show that in this direct matchup with Keegan Murray, you're a far better player. Go and show us that. Go and show us that you're worth the 130, $150 million, whatever it is that you want, by outplaying someone that is a fairly similar stature to you in terms of age, experience, all that kind of thing. So I just put the onus on a couple of young guys because see what you can unearth here. And with some of the veteran guys, like a Buddy Hill, like a Kyle Anderson, GP2 off the bench, whoever else, we know who they are. We know what they're going to give. But you've got to try and, you know, you've got to look at how the Warriors are going to become a top four to six team in the West this season. And the only way for them to do it is for these young guys to take a leap. And so let them go for it in preseason. Let them try and show you what they can do, right? And if they fail, very disappointing, but nothing really lost. It's a preseason game. You go back to the regular season, you lean on your veterans a little bit more. Fine. But maybe it's the making of them. Maybe you give Moses Moody the task on DeMar Rose and you say, okay, go out there and play 25, 30 minutes. And maybe that's the making of him. And all of a sudden, we're looking at this guy and Steve looks at this guy as a 25, 30-minute player. I don't know. Talking more on Kaminga. Stoop Convo, this is also on Moody as well. Stoop Convo says, Moody always plays good, still gets no minutes. In reality, he deserves more minutes than JK. I can see an argument for that. I certainly can. I, I will go back to what I just said, though, with the Warriors need to unearth something that is different to what they've currently got. And their only way of being a a top tier team in the West this season is getting a leap from a young player. And I still think of all the Warriors, young players, Moody, Pods, TJD, whoever else, JK is still the one with the highest upside. JK is still the one where 
if we get to February and he's all of a sudden close to being the all star, like a, a tier just a tier below all star caliber player, then we wouldn't necessarily be surprised. Like he's got that capacity. As I don't think we're going to say that about Moses Moody. I don't think we're saying that Moses Moody has all star potential. JK does, and therefore, yes, I can see, like, I think Moody fits in more lineups. I can abs- absolutely understand why you'd think that Moody should get more minutes. But in terms of where the Warriors need to go, I think Kaminga's still more important, and that's why you need to give him more minutes. <clears throat> um, Alistair McDonald also said, JK, his defense is still bleep <laughs> a lot of the time. The positioning is just so bad. He beats himself even before he actually has to guard anyone, just giving up open lanes and back doors all day long. I, I, I agree with that to an extent. There was a play in the first quarter where he had a really awkward closeout where I'm not even sure what he was doing. And I can't remember who, I think it was Terrence Mann. It was Terrence Mann. And he kind of, like, it was just an awkward closeout and he just allowed Terrence Mann a free lane to the rim for a layup. It was bizarre. It was a really poor effort. And it's one of those efforts, again, where I, like, will go back and say, you know, this preseason should mean a lot. Like, these young guys should be out there playing really, really hard. And that's like, like if Draymond made that play, if Draymond just allowed an easy lane to the rim, I'd be like, okay, cool. I don't care. I know you're one of the best defenders of this generation. It's preseason. You're a bit lazy on that possession. Whatever. I don't care. But for a young guy who's still trying to make his way, who's still trying to solidify his role, you can't do that. You can't, like, Steve will look at that, and that's a, a cross next to your name. That's a bad play that will hinder your opportunity going forward. Like, you've got to make the most of every play in preseason as as a young guy in this Warriors team. Uh, I'll I'll move on from there. Lindy Waters, the third. True mentality said, totally love Waters too. Freaking epic last shot. I'm a little worried about his defense against some better players, but I think that's something we need to see. Yep, I said on last episode, we need to see him... Uh, playing alongside better players and playing against better players because obviously all his minutes on Saturday came in um, not, not garbage time as such, but against end of the bench guys, which he technically is as well at this point, given you know we've noted him as the 13th or 14th guy on the Warriors roster. But you go five or seven from three-point range, you make that final buzzer-beating shot as you did. You're the third best shooter on the roster behind Steph and Buddy Heald. I spoke about it in the last episode. You've got to try and find a way to utilize that. Who makes way for him in that situation? I don't know. What I will say about Lindy Waters is that, again, it again reiterates to me that we can blame and criticize the front office for their lack of um, being able to get a star this offseason in, in the way of PG or marketing or whoever else. Jimmy Butler, I'm sure all these names will come up. LeBron going back to last season's deadline. What we can't criticize the front office for, and specifically Mike Dunleavy Jr., is his ability to make moves on the margin. Since he took over from uh, Bob Myers going back to the end of the 2022-23 season, if you look at the moves he's made, drafting pods and TJD with speculative picks 19th and 57th, all of a sudden those guys are real rotation players, starting caliber players almost by the end of their rookie season. He goes and gets Lindy Waters. He goes and gets... Buddy Heald, Melton, Kyle Anderson, really valuable role players on what look like really team-friendly contracts. So in terms of like spots 6 through 15, like filling out the bench, I think Dunleavy's done a fantastic job. And even like a guy like Pods looks like he could be a long-term starter for you. TJD as well maybe, but we'll maybe talk about him in a second. So there's you cannot criticize Mark Dunleavy in any way. For that, and Lindy Waters the third is another example. And Steve was praising Mike after Saturday's game, basically, um, so, you know, praising him for being able to evaluate Lindy Waters the third, identifying him, and then being able to trade for him, just giving up cash essentially, uh, and really identifying not just talent but specific warrior fits. Because I think you look at these guys in terms of Pods and TJD in the draft. Warrior style players. You look at guys like Melton and Kyle Anderson, warrior style players, should fit perfectly into the system. You look at Lindy Waters, the third, in terms of the Warriors still wanting to be a high volume three point shooting team. You go and grab a guy who's 43% in the NBA last season, 40, 43% in the G League. Like these are great moves from Mike Dunleavy, but at the end of the day, can he get a second co-star for Steph or can one of these young guys like Kaminga develop to become that? That's going to be what ultimately catapults the Warriors back into contention, not 
what you do on the remainder of the roster. And also makes me wonder whether or not you could actually, like you should pull the trigger for a blockbuster trade for a star where maybe you you know you get rid of some of that depth maybe it's a three for one or four for one trade you remove some of your depth you bring in a star maybe that you should pull the trigger on that because we as fans i i have faith in that situation that mike dunleavy will be able to evaluate and identify the right guys to fill out the rest of the roster in a pretty sufficient manner where you could get some role players that could actually help you a little bit he's proven that he can do that and so that should actually make you push more to try and make a blockbuster trade because you're good at filling out the rest of the roster once that trade is is completed. I don't know. Just um, food for thought there. The other thing, Mark Forever said, Lindy Ward is better than Damian Lee. That's a good comparison. That's actually a pretty – I mean, they're fairly similar. They're, like, they're the same size, fairly similar. I'd probably say Ward is, is going to be the better, more consistent shooter when he's out there, but Damian Lee – does some of the other stuff maybe a little bit more versatile in terms of I don't I don't know I wouldn't say that Damian Lee was a plus defender by any means but he might be more solid than what Waters proves to be on the defensive end. Damian Lee was also an excellent rebounder for a guard. Remember that game was it like Christmas? I think it was Christmas 2019 where we won that game against the Rockets in the in the otherwise horrible season. Damian Lee had like 15 rebounds or something and he was a, a pretty good rebounder throughout his warrior tenure just a shout out to damian lee as well he's making his return he missed all of last season through injury he played in the sun's first preseason game uh the other night against the lakers so good luck to him forever a warriors champion uh, just a couple of things here in terms of trace jackson davis and the warriors uh center department at the moment berserk monk said was a great game a lot to take from it even if it's just preseason zubak was bullying tjd though and he's not even in the top tier of centers in the league that the warriors will face Yep, it's a point that I made on last episode. There was a, a few times there where TJD got cooked, whether it be in the pick and roll or just simply in post-up opportunities where I want to, I don't want this to, to be too much of a TJD, TJD thing because I do think Zubak is a little bit underrated in terms of being able to take advantage of his extra size in, term, in contrast to a guy like TJD who he's got a few inches on. He's actually a pretty good post player. He's got pretty good feel around the rim. So, yes, Zubak isn't necessarily in the top 10 centers in the league, but he is an underrated one. Like, I'd take him at the Warriors. I think he's pretty good. Uh, obviously, doesn't stretch the floor or anything like the Warriors need. But in terms of just an interior big, He's a he's a good starting caliber NBA center. He has been for quite some years with the Clippers now. But yes, it did shine a light on can TJD be the anchor of a defense for Golden State when you're six nine, six ten and you're coming up against genuine seven footers like Zubak, Jokic we know, Embiid we know. The, all these guys, you know, there's plenty around the league, as I said on last episode. Looking forward to the, the first matchup against Aiton and, and what the Warriors do there because, you know, Aiton is, for all the criticism for the value or lack of value in his contract, he's a talented offensive player. Of course, the Trailblazers just drafted Donovan Klingon as well. So it'll be interesting to see how the Warriors match up there. Uh, but certainly, TJD wasn't a great first up performance, that's for sure. Uh, Mulder God. I'm going to pronounce that. I apologize if I got that wrong. Turnovers kill us every year. Curry's a push the pace kind of guy. I think stretch. I think a stretch big who can handle the ball like Cat would fit them well. Well, obviously Cat isn't available any uh, anymore. I'm I'm not sure it necessarily it has to be a big that can handle the ball. Like I suppose technically you would say Draymond if you want to classify him as a big. He handles the ball and is one of the Warriors' key playmakers. So I don't think that's necessarily. Uh, needed. It's just more of the shooting aspect, and I've spoken about it relentlessly. <laughs> it's the biggest void on the Warrior roster right now. Cat no longer available. They missed on marketing, and the big one, who I said previously going back after they missed on marketing, my number one trade target in terms of realistic options that you know not necessarily star Wendell Carter Jr. He's no longer available. Just today, signed an extension with the Magic, which means he cannot be traded prior to February's midseason deadline. That's disappointing. That's disappointing because the Warriors have had a little bit of interest in the past. They, I tweeted it out today. It makes me very depressed. There was talk, there were reports at the 20, just before the 2020 NBA draft 
that the Warriors were looking to trade down from pick two and potentially trade down with the Chicago Bulls, get Wendell Carter Jr. and pick four, give up pick two to them in the process, allowing the Bulls to take James Wiseman. The Warriors were then, according to, I think, Connor Letourneau at that point of the San Francisco Chronicle, the Warriors were very interested in Denny Avdia. So really there's a world here, and who knows how it would play out, let's be honest. But there's a world here in which the Warriors could have had Wendell Carter Jr. and Denny Avdia instead of drafting James Wiseman. And just think about the roster right now, if you just added Wendell Carter Jr. and Denny Avdia, because Wendell Carter Jr., he's not a star by any means. There's some injury issues, clearly, over the last couple of seasons. But I think he would be ideal for this Warrior system as a stretch big shot 37.4% from three-point range last season. Reasonable interior defender, good rebounder. I just think him next to Draymond would be perfect. Allows JK to potentially play at the three, given the floor spacing there. So very disappointing from a Warrior standpoint that Wendell Carter Jr. is no longer available. It was a three-year, $59 million extension, so just under 20 mil a year. I think he's making something like 24, 25 over the next two seasons. He's now in a contract for five years at like $92 million or something like that, which is still really good value, I think, for the Magic, so long as he can stay healthy. Uh, he played in their first preseason game today, uh, was it was in their starting was in their starting lineup, which I think that was the reason why there was some talk during the offseason from genuine reporters that uh, he may have been gettable simply because the Magic re-signed Gogo Batatse and Mo Wagner in the offseason. So they've got quite a – they've got a trio of big men who all kind of deserve rotation minutes there. And maybe Carter was the one, given his injury history and stuff like that, that he may have been gettable for rival teams. He certainly would have been a lot of suitors around the league. I think the Pelicans were the one that was probably most strongly interested in him, given that they need a centre. Um, the Lakers as well. Clearly, the Warriors, I don't know. <laughs> Obviously, we don't know if there was any trade calls or anything on that, but clearly, I think Wendell Carter Jr. would have been a perfect fit for the Warriors, particularly at the price point of you're paying the guy $11, $12 million over the next two seasons. Obviously, he's got the extension beyond that now. And from a trade standpoint, wouldn't have cost the world. Like, I don't think it's a move that would have then limited you, you to be able to doing something else. So that's disappointing. And now... Who is it in terms of a stretch big that you could go out and get? I think Kelly Olynyk's probably the main one from a Warriors standpoint. I don't know why Toronto traded for him last season. He would probably be the one that I would look at. 33 years old, proven veteran, not only a good shooter, but um, as Malda God uh, said, in terms of kind of ball handling and playmaking, Kelly Olynyk can provide a little bit of that as well. Now, again, is he going to be your starting five on a playoff team? I'm not sure he can hold up defensively to be able to do that, but maybe next to Draymond it can work. I don't know. Uh, But clearly it's the biggest hole on the Warriors roster right now and something they need to address. And ideally, like, it's got to be before the deadline and ideally it should be fairly soon because if they wait till the deadline, the season might be over by that point Uh, and they might just be looking ahead to to the roster for 2025-26. A um, couple of more here. Uh, Kenneth Hardiman asks, why are there so many small guards? Uh, and then Alistair also said, but uh, these tiny guard heavy lineups have to end. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's been a constant theme for Golden State over the years, uh, over recent years, hasn't it? The kind of amount of small guards that they've had. Uh, I think they're a little bit better this season simply because like I like Milton like Milton is small but he's a really good defender uh and he's obviously got some offensive stuff as well in his game very good shooter uh the the three guard heavy lineups yes I agree they have to end but I don't think that's necessarily going to be the case I think there's going to be times where you could have Steph Milton if you need shooting healed maybe pods it depends. Like, you also have to have a genuine big out there with them. I mean, ideally, I'm with you. Ideally, I'm with you. They should just end, but I don't think they're going to necessarily. Uh, and then this is another you know, position where if we do see these three guard lineups, then it's ve- going to be very easy to say as fans, like, like, why isn't Moody one of these guys? Like, why can't you just get a bit of extra size, a genuine wing out there in Moses Moody? 
sh- like you're going to be more versatile defensively and like what are you going to lose by having him out there as opposed to someone else because he can also shoot the ball at a reasonable clip as well. So th- that's going to be the thing is if we see these three guard lineups, there's so many other options now at Steve's disposal in terms of how deep the roster is that we shouldn't necessarily see them. But then how do you fit them all in with Steph, Melton, Pods, Heald, uh, GP2 as well? Like, I don't I don't know. I think GP2 looking from Saturday's game, I know he did some things defensively and Steve was pretty happy with his performance. I think he's probably the one that's on the outside looking in right now. And then whether or not, He's the one that therefore gets utilized in a trade with his $9.1 million expiring contract. I don't know, but we'll wait and see on that. Uh, a couple other things, just in terms of the general um, play from the Warriors and their style, Henry Asokin said their transition defense looks very reminiscent of 2022. Now just need to build the confidence and consist- consistency to generate three-point shots efficiently. My issue with, like, yes, okay, they've brought in Buddy Hill, they've got Lindy Waters, hopefully elite from Moody. There's still not the three-point shooting that was there on the 2022 championship team. When you're talking about Steph, Clay, Jordan Poole, Wiggins at that point was like a pretty high-volume, efficient three-point shooter. His volume plummeted last season. We'll see if he can get back to what he was uh, in that all-star season. But, again, that's a wait and see. Otto Porter Jr., like that's the that's the guy the Warriors are still trying to replace, right? Otto Porter Jr. That's who we're speaking about in terms of a guy in the front court who can shoot. If you could just put, if there's any Warrior role player in the last ten years you could put on the roster right now, it is 2021-22 Otto Porter Jr. It is because that is exactly what the Warriors are missing. They've tried to replace it with the likes of uh, Jermichael Green, Dario Saric. Both failed. They haven't really got that option on this roster. Yes, they drafted Quinton Post. Looks a fair way away from ever being a rotation player. We'll wait and see on him. But Otto Porter Jr. is the guy they're trying to replace. And so when you say, you know, the the confidence and the consistency to generate three-point shots efficiently, I'm still hesitant on whether this team can be an elite three-point shooting team because they've got two... Two elite shooters, I'd say. Three if you want to include Waters, but two of those guys, Heald and Waters. Waters probably still won't be in the rotation at midnight. And Heald isn't a starter. He's not playing, you know, he's he's probably not going to be playing 25 minutes a game. He might, but again, I keep saying we'll wait and see, but (laughs) it it is what it is at this point. Uh, Maybe Moody can take a jump and he can become that elite three-point shooter, 40% guy. Uh, who knows? So that's my issue is, you know, the Warriors talk about being a high-volume three-point shooting team, but they don't necessarily have the cattle that they did a couple of years ago in that 2021-22 championship team. Forever Sims, last one here, says, it's really concerning how they shot the three. I saw a lot of players literally running into each other off screens. Steve wants more defense, but it's really hard, and it showed tonight. They were bricking almost everything. Uh is good, but I uh, TJ sorry TJD is good, but I've been saying he's not really the starting center they're looking for. A lot of these issues is roster construction, and that's the front office fault. But otherwise, free Moody and Lindy agree with almost everything that you said there. Uh, just spoke about the three ball, so I agree with you uh, in terms of that. Uh, TJD the the stuff that you said there, I agree with. Already spoke about that. Uh, and then the last point, a lot of these issues is roster construction. That's the front office fault. Yeah, I mean, just as we've been saying, reiterated throughout the entire off season, I think that was, again, obvious in the first preseason game. The roster is too deep with not enough high-end talent. Uh, and there's a lot of versatility there. There is a lot of versatility aside from the one huge hole of not having that stretch big just to – it doesn't even need to be a stretch big that starts necessarily, but just having the option available to you. And let me say, Quinton Post didn't look like a guy that is going to be an option available to you if you want to be a good basketball team in 2023 24. Maybe next season, maybe the year after. I know I'm basing it just on one performance. Uh, and who knows, he could turn that around and become something that we don't expect. But even Steve has said that he's going to spend majority of the time in the G League this season. So, uh, yeah, that's the takeaways from you guys on uh, on Saturday's preseason game. Spoke a little bit there before in terms of Wednesday's 
preseason game against the Kings. The starting lineup that I might like to see, that one that we saw just for three minutes in the second quarter on Saturday. But other than that, let me know if you have any thoughts from Saturday's game, what you're looking forward to on Wednesday's game. We'll be back for a podcast episode after that. Uh, other than that, if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel already, that'd be greatly appreciated. You can follow me at POC252, that's P-O-K, 252 and X slash Twitter. And other than that, I'll see you in the next episode.